As we gather around God's Word together, I want to encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We have been studying through the book of Titus for some months now, and it is our intentions to wrap things up in the book of Titus today. It is interesting that the final instructions and the final greetings from Paul to Titus, who is on the island of Crete, some would regard it as maybe insignificant, not as important or not as valuable or as loaded with doctrinal themes as was the first sections of Titus. And I can understand where they're coming from, certainly, that there was a lot of doctrinal statements throughout the book. Things like this. If we looked back through the first chapter, we see that God has ordained that there be godly leaders appointed. We call them elders. Uh, Godly leaders are to be appointed in the churches. We could read through chapter 1 and see that that's the predominant theme, appoint godly leaders. If you move to chapter 2 of Titus, you see that there is a clear uh, command to teach God's people and exactly what they should teach them. The character of God's called out people should look a particular way. And so that is definitely there. Chapter 2 is all loaded with teaching God's people and what they should be taught. And then chapter 3 there is a calling to remind them of God's marvelous, sufficient grace to carry out that which which they've been called to do. I think that the whole epistle is loaded with those themes of appoint godly leaders, teach God's people, and remind them of God's grace. If we wanted to put it in three points from each chapter, it would probably sound something like that. We could say that it's the genuine power of the gospel shaping the Christian's life. But we also recognize throughout the epistle of Titus this reiteration of good works, good deeds. We read phrases like, people who are false are worthless for any good deeds. We talk about those who should be in leadership should be an example of good deeds. In the, in the epistle of Titus, there is an encouragement for Christians to be zealous for good deeds or good works. There is a command to be ready for every good deed, every good work. There is a reminder that God saved us not on the basis of these good deeds. There is also a responsibility to be careful after telling us that it's not what saves us. There's a responsibility to remind us to be careful to engage in good deeds, good works. And in the last part, the part we'll look at today, there's a reminder to tell them to learn how to engage in good works. They ought to be busy about it. So we see in this epistle, appoint godly leaders, teach God's people, and then remind them that God's grace is sufficient. And in the midst of all of that, remind them to be zealous for good works. They don't save them at all. But the church ought to be known in Crete for good deeds fueled by God's grace. And the same is true today. We are to appoint godly leaders. We are to teach God's people. We are to call into remembrance the sufficiency of God's grace. And we are to be at New Hope Baptist Church just as sure as it was true in Crete. We are to be busy about good works, not because they save us at all, but because we have been saved. We should devote ourselves to good works. And the text today seems like it might just be loaded with just some goodbyes. But I want to draw some conclusions from it as we read it and hopefully... Um, give you a little bit better understanding of what's going on there. Titus chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis. For I have decided to spend the winter there. 
Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. All who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Let us pray together. Almighty God, as we conclude our time of study in this epistle, I pray that we would recognize that we have just read, although a conclusion to the letter, we have just read your God-breathed word. You said these things through the Apostle Paul on purpose for a reason. May we, by the Spirit's enablement, understand even more from this conclusion about your character, about your design and calling for the church. Help us to truly live out what we learn today. May it be for your glory. Help me to teach your word in spite of the sinfulness of both the speaker and the hearer. I pray, Lord, that those things would be confessed, repented of, so that we can clearly hear from you today. May it be so in Jesus' name. Amen. Stephen Cole, a, a preacher that I love to read, made these comments in lead up to this text. I want to read it to you because I think he sets the stage better than anybody I've read regarding this conclusion. Listen as I read it. He says, For a few moments, erase from your mind the past 1900 plus years of church history. Go back to the first century. Rome ruled the world. If you were to ask for a list of the prominent religions of the world, Christianity would possibly be missing. Perhaps it would be listed as a minor offshoot of Judaism. Its followers claimed that some obscure Galilean Jew who had been crucified was the promised Jewish Messiah and that he had been raised from the dead. But the average man on the street had not heard the good news of Christianity. The world was essentially pagan. Into that scene, project an obscure little Jewish man named Paul, who hailed from the southern coast of what we call Turkey. He had met the risen Lord Jesus Christ, who had commissioned him to take the gospel to the Gentile world. It was an enormous task. How should he go about doing it? Remember, Stephen Cole continues, he had no mass media. He couldn't broadcast the message by radio or TV or tapes or CDs. He didn't have the printing press, much less the internet. He didn't even have the post office to send out bulk mailings. Furthermore, there was no rapid transportation system. He couldn't drive on modern highways or take a train or jet from city to city, he had to walk or take a boat. He couldn't pick up the phone, push a few buttons, and talk with his key co-workers. He communicated with them by hand-carried letters that took weeks or sometimes months to deliver. Yet in spite of these limitations, Paul, by God's grace, did it. He launched the Christian message to the Gentiles and permanently changed the history of the world. But how did he do it? And I think, honestly, our text today gives us a shadow at least or a little bit better understanding of how he did it. 
Paul reached the world for God's glory, by God's grace, through Spirit-empowered, Spirit-enabled believers who were absolutely committed to the ministry of the Great Commission. That's what happened. Paul was not a one-man show at all. He had a team. He had a team that believed the gospel was saved by God's grace. He had a team that accomplished this task for the Lord's glory. Now, obviously, the Lord alone gets the credit. Obviously, God alone gets the glory. But it is interesting in this letter that we are reading right now, one of those hand-carried letters God has preserved for us, which we have read, we have studied through. This is one of those hand-carried letters. Think about that for a moment. That God has preserved his word in such a way that we are holding, reading, in English, translated from original Koine Greek, a hand-carried letter from the chosen vessel of God to take the gospel to the Gentiles, which he wrote to his co-laborer Titus, who's on an island in the middle of the Mediterranean. We're reading it. We're learning from it. And he mentions not that he is a one-man show at all, but he mentions people in this text. One of those people is the recipient of the letter. That's Titus. And if you want to look at it this way, there is a team that God is using. I think that's the best analogy for us is the team Obviously, we have a church that's a body, but in this sense, they are going to different churches to encourage the saints as a team with the same goal in mind. One of the things I know about a team, as I love coaching, and some of my volleyball players are in this very room right now, I can tell you that if they were all the same, a bunch of them would be unnecessary. We have different positions that they must assume, different roles that they are better in than in other roles. And it's the coach's job to make sure that everyone is doing not only what they're passionate about, but what they're skilled to do, what they're gifted to do. And sometimes you have unique personalities that make up a team. Sometimes you have people who come from different situations who might have different attitudes and sometimes you just got to learn how to read them and and understand them and and hone in on what God's gifted them with and how they're geared. Well, Paul, in a similar way, by discernment through the Holy Spirit, was given the gift of knowing what this person was skilled with, what that person was skilled with, where they were both best serving the, the church. And you can see it in this concluding this conclusion of this letter, you can see what he's doing. He's putting people in certain positions based on what he senses from the Spirit of God as an apostle where they need to be. So if we want to look at it this way, we can actually meet a part of that team today. I want to actually highlight each of these characters for just a moment so that we know just a little bit more about them. The first one, the recipient of the letter, we know about him, Titus. Titus is talked about not only in this letter, we meet him actually in some other epistles. Titus is a Gentile. The guess of most commentators at this time when receiving the letters is he is probably in his late 30s. To a great number of people, they might even consider him somewhat of a novice, young. Timothy was in a similar boat. You remember people were... Uh, Paul was warning him, don't let anybody despise you because you're young. You, you've been called of God. So Titus, this Gentile in his late 30s, we see him last in Holy Scripture in 2 Timothy 4 because Paul, before he's getting ready to die, says in 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. 
and Titus to Dalmatia. So later in life, in, in Paul's last letter, he recognizes that the very ones that he has enjoyed the company of are not with him. Titus, Crescens, and the devastation of Demas loving the present world was also heavy on Paul's mind in his last writings. But you notice that recognition of Titus. Well, why is Titus so precious? Why is he so precious to Paul? Well, do you remember, let me just give you a little bit of a a background for the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, Paul writes a letter to the Corinthians, the first one, and he addresses some confusion, some sin, um, some some struggles that they are having. Uh, He calls them a church. He calls them believers. But he says, man, there's a lot of problems there. And in 1 Corinthians, he tells them to do some things. He says, discipline the the immoral person, expel the immoral brother from among you, exercise church discipline, get your your Lord's Supper celebrations straight, get your understanding straight about how you should conduct yourselves as a body that needs one another, all of these different things going on. They had some confusion about the resurrection, not understanding exactly what happens during the resurrection. Some were saying it had already taken place. And he said, no, it hasn't. And what happened was, he used Titus. And we know this, we know that he used Titus to go to the Corinthian church because of what is said in 2 Corinthians, that second letter, where he writes again to the Corinthians, and he's very happy in that second letter. If you look at the first letter to the Corinthians, he's troubled at what's going on with them. In the second letter, he is encouraged that they have done what is right, They've corrected some things. They've exercised church discipline. There's better things happening. And the reporter of that good news back to Paul is Titus, the very one who's receiving this letter. Let me just read that to you. 2 Corinthians, um, this is in chapter 2. Paul is at first, his spirit is not at rest because he didn't find his brother Titus there. So he's concerned, where is Titus? In chapter 7, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians, you can write these references down, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 6, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. Titus is coming with some information. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 13, we are comforted and besides our own comfort, we rejoice still more at the joy of Titus because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. So not only did Titus go to Corinth and encourage them, the Corinthians are encouraging Titus, and Titus is coming back and telling Paul, and there is this celebration of what's going on. And the messenger of this news is Titus, the very one that he's mentioning in the conclusion of the letter to Titus. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 16, But thanks be to God who put into the heart of Titus the same earnest care that I have for you. What's he saying there? He's saying, Paul is saying, Titus has the same heart for the Corinthian church that the Apostle Paul does. Those are big words. Most of the time when we say, man, the Apostle Paul, what an amazing person. The Apostle Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is saying, you know who has just as big a heart for the Corinth church as I? Titus. He has that big of a heart for the Corinthian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 18 says, I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? Did we not act in the same spirit? Did we not take the same steps? Basically, he's giving the credibility again to Titus to be able to speak on behalf of the apostles. He's carrying the letter that has authority. Now let me look at outside of the church at Corinth, and now let's look at the church at Galatia. Was Titus, this team member of the gospel proclamation to the Gentiles, was he in any way involved in the church at Galatia? I'm building the case here that this team concept of taking the gospel somewhere did not just involve the apostle Paul. I know you know that, but biblically, where's it at? It's in Galatia. Galatians, just to set up the scene there at that church. And by the way, every letter to the churches in the New Testament was addressing issues specific to that church. 
Galatia did not have the same problems that Corinth had. They were different. Galatia had a problem with Judaism and legalism creeping in, judging people by rules, regulations, dietary standards. And Titus was there. He's mentioned in the letter. Let me read it to you. Galatians 2, verse 1. After 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. Galatians 2, verse 3, he says to the Galatians, but even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Now here's how we know that he was a Gentile. And he's not bowing to the Galatian model of suggesting that you have to follow all Jewish laws and traditions in order to be a true Christian. Paul is saying, no, 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 no. He said it to Peter, he said it to the others, and he uses Titus as an example. He says, listen, if, if that was right, Titus would have needed to have been circumcised, but he was not circumcised. Now, just as a, another rabbit chase, Paul is big on becoming, and the Lord is big on us, becoming all things to all men so that in every means we might win some. This is exactly why I think he had Timothy uh, circumcised, so that it would not be a stumbling block. But in this case, with Galatia, He's saying, Titus, we're not about to bow to that because they're thinking it means you're more spiritual now that you have it, and that does not back up with the holy word of God. That's not right. So Titus is one that's been used as an example for Paul, a co-laborer with Paul, a messenger for Paul, a letter carrier, a reporter back to how the churches are doing. My goodness, Titus wore many hats. But we read in our epistle that we've been studying for the last few months what Paul thinks about Titus. Let me read it to you. It's Titus chapter 1, verse 4. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. My true child in a common faith. Most would agree that this means that it was Paul who was the introducer of Christ to Titus, that he indeed was the one who shared the gospel with him, discipled him, helped him grow in the faith. He was like a father, spiritually speaking, to Titus. So Titus is the first player, the first team member of this gospel thrust in the early church. The second one mentioned in Titus chapter 3 verse 12 is Artemis. This is the only reference to this man, Artemis. We don't know a lot about him. We can guess from his name just because of some Greek mythology that he is a Gentile. And the reason why is because he considered him a worthy replacement for Titus, which is probably a good reason why he probably was so that it's not a stumbler for them in Crete. We can definitely guess that he is knowledgeable, competent. He's a faithful, mature man of God. And if Paul, one commentator said it like this, if Paul ended up sending Tychicus to Ephesus and Titus met Paul in Nicopolis and then headed north to Dalmatia, then Artemis is probably the one who replaced him in Crete. It's very possible that Artemis actually replaces Titus in Crete. Notice verse number 12 of Titus 3. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, and by other writings we believe Tychicus will go somewhere else, then it's likely that Artemis is the one who follows up the work in Crete behind Titus. Now this is interesting because he does not want to leave any flock without a faithful shepherd. Never. Why? Because that is the most opportune time for the wolves to come in and try to devour the flock. But Artemis is not one that we hear a lot about, but his name is in the pages of Holy Scripture, and so we do certainly recognize that God used him for the Great Commission, for the spreading of the gospel and the edification of saints. Now we meet another person in verse number 12 when I send Artemis or Tychicus. To you. Here is another faithful Gentile believer. We know a little bit more about him. He's from Western Turkey. He's a native of Asia. He's traveling with Paul along with some other men. 
in Acts chapter 20. Let me read it to you. Acts chapter 20, verse 4. So Peter the Berean, son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius of Derby and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. Acts chapter 20 tells us on these missionary journeys that Paul took, Tychicus is a part of those journeys. He's mentioned in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, so that you also may know how I'm doing and what I'm doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. How will he tell them everything? The book of Ephesians is sent by Tychicus to tell the Ephesian church how Paul is doing. Think about this, folks. You um, probably on a, on a monthly basis trust, whether it be UPS, the United States Postal Service, Federal Express, wh- whoever it is that is your carrier, you are trusting that they will take what you are feeling necessary to send, you are trusting them to carry it directly where it needs to go. Okay? Now, this is before UPS. This is before any of those things. And this is Holy Scripture inspired by God to be written. There's not a mass production copy. You know, he, he, he's not sitting there with five guys writing it out. Think about the marvelous power of the Spirit to preserve God's Word. As Paul says, Tychicus, this must go to Ephesus. Go. And he takes off all kinds of dangers on the road, all kinds of things that can happen, and God in his preservation of his Word and his people and his plan takes it exactly where it needs to go. Sends back report that it has reached there It is being read everywhere, and Tychicus comes back and says, Paul, it's there. What a glorious unfolding of God's glorious gospel going forward. Even in Colossians, Tychicus is mentioned. Chapter 4, verse 7, Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord. Now, in your spare time, let me just read one more, 2 Timothy 4.12, before Paul is approaching his death, he says, Tychicus I've sent to Ephesus. So Tychicus has been in Ephesus, Colossae, Ephesus. He was with Paul in Acts 20 at Thess- at, with the Thessalonians. In your spare time, Go and look at a map of New Testament times and locate all of these places. Take your little scale out. Measure the distance between the two things. Know that they regularly came back to Antioch each and every time to celebrate with the church what was going on. Don't just draw a line from every city we mentioned. And do all of that on foot. Do all of that with the dangers that are set before them to deliver these words of precious Holy Scripture to the church. Can I just say something to you for a moment? Not only after you think about that do we recognize we are spoiled, but let me also tell you we are blessed. Because not only did God preserve His Word to take it to Ephesus, Colossa, Thessalonica, and Galatia, and every other church in the first century. God has preserved his word in such a way that you and I don't have to understand Koine Greek to understand that Jesus is the central theme of all things, and everything rises and falls with the sinless Son of God, and he's preserved it for over 2,000 years so that all of the elect from every generation will come to faith in Christ. That's amazing. 
And we can't remember much of anything. Yet God, in his glorious plan of redemption, preserved his word. It's, it's amazing to think about. Antichicus is a part of that body that God ordained to use to send the message that will save sinners and the message that will equip the saints. Another gentleman that we meet on the journey in Titus chapter 3 is a man by the name of Zenos the lawyer. But before we go to Zenos the lawyer, there is a geographic reference in the text. Do your best, Titus, to come to me at Nicopolis. So he's writing to Titus and saying, as soon as Artemis or Tychicus get to you, I want you to come here to me in Nicopolis. This is an interesting location, Nicopolis, a busy port on the western coast. I didn't know this fun fact, that it's actually known for its harsh winters. And even though they were harsh winters, many travelers from all parts would basically be forced to spend the winter there. That's why there were so many reports about it being harsh winters. Why would Paul want to endure a very difficult winter? Why would he not want to go to the beach? Well, I just told you. Because there's going to be lots of people there. What do people mean? Why, why such, a, such a need for a bunch of people? Could it be, let's see, that he might want to tell them the glorious good news of the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, folks, Paul was not looking, I can say it this way, he wasn't looking for a resort. He, was, he, he had far in mind bigger things about regeneration than vacation. He felt like there was a short amount of time to preach the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and every single opportunity, I believe, from where he says, I'm going to winter right here. I believe part of it is definitely because there's going to be a lot of people there. Come there. That's where I'm going to be. Nicopolis, western coast of Greece. Lots of people. Harsh winters. We can say it like this. Thank you, Lord, for the snow. I have a captive audience. Now, by the way, I made a reference about something that perhaps is very American. Harsh winters do not automatically mean snow. Did you, did you all know that? I could go on a rabbit chase there, but it's not Christmas without snow. Uh, my son-in-law's a Brazilian. He, ain't, he never had a white Christmas in Brazil. He don't even know the song. There's a reason. The song makes no sense in Brazil. Y'all understand that, right? Y'all following with me? So we've got to go back to the original language. Okay, I digressed. Okay, we return back. Zenus the lawyer, next person in the team. Zenus the lawyer. Interesting here. Zenus the lawyer, do your best to, to speed Zenus the lawyer and Apollos on their, way, on their way. See that they lack nothing. Now, here's another reason why we have to go back to original context because we in our culture don't think that a lawyer needs anything from anybody in order to make it. They're making the dough. Right? In our mind, we're thinking... That's a profession that's very lucrative in our culture. Why would he need assistance to move forward? Why would he need help from the body of Christ to help him go on? Well, we have to understand in its context that the attorney, the lawyer side of things, may very well imply that he was a Jewish expert in the Mosaic law. And why would there not be much money in Crete for that. Because they're not in Galatia. 
where it's a big problem over religious legalism matters. They're all Greeks. They didn't grow up with the Mosaic law. And so this brother, Zenos the lawyer, is just identified as his profession perhaps, but he needs assistance to move forward with the gospel, to go somewhere else with the gospel. And not a whole lot is said. This is the only reference in the New Testament concerning him. But the guy he's with, the guy he's traveling with, this guy we know. His name in verse 13 is Apollos. He's been mentioned many times. He is this dear brother who is a Jew from Alexandria. If you remember, he's from northern Egypt. He's an eloquent speaker. He's mighty in the scriptures. The Bible says he's fervent in spirit. He's, man, I tell you, he's, he's solid. But he's got some pieces missing. He's got some doctrinal theological things that need to be helped along. The Bible tells us in Acts 18, verse 24, a Jew named Apollos, that is this Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. But what we know about him in the next few verses is that some of Paul's other co-laborers, Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple, take Apollos in, into their home, and privately disciple him so that he can clearly understand the person, the work, the fulfillment, the power of the name of Jesus Christ and can clearly teach it. And let me tell you what I believe is an absolutely glorious picture of true regeneration. We don't read about it, but we see it very much fleshed out in the life of Apollos that he was a humble enough man before the Lord that he received that discipleship. He received that guidance. He received that guidance in such a way that the very next chapter of Acts 19.1, it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country, came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. If you go on into the first letter to the churches, the Corinthian letter, Apollos has learned in such a way, has become more and more solid in the faith through the mentorship of Aquila and Priscilla and the discipleship from them, that even Paul, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, references the problem at Corinth by saying it like this. 1 Corinthians 1.12, What I mean in the division of things, each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow who? Apollos or I follow Cephas. This dear brother from Alexandria, a Jew who knew not the way completely, was humble enough to learn from Aquila and Priscilla so much so that his eloquence, his ability to speak and learn and grow had developed such an influence that some people thought, I follow that guy. And Paul diminishes that by saying in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4, When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not merely being human? And what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all or your, are yours. Here's the point. When Paul said, what is Apollos? You might say, Paul is saying, what is Apollos compared to the Apostle Paul? But what he concluded with was, what is Apollos? And then he said, and what is Paul? You know what he just did when he said that? He put Apollos and Paul on the same level because they are both servants of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Same level. When he said that in Corinthians, he says, listen, 
We're all the same. We're messengers of the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have different roles. We have different callings, but we are all the same as members of one body. Now think about that in relationship to Titus chapter 3. You got, you got Paul writing a letter as an apostle. You got Titus, Tychicus, Zenus, Artemis, and now Apollos. But the text makes it clear one is not more important than the other. They're all on the same team. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, he says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, that you may learn not to go beyond what's written, and that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Evidently, Apollos was a well-liked brother. And Paul guards them from man worship. Paul guards them from preferring one person over another and says, listen, we're all servants of the living Christ. We have different roles, but none of us are worthy of worship or recognition. All of that goes to Jesus. You say, well, that concludes the mention of anyone on the team. Actually, no, it doesn't. Look with me in verse 13. You are right in saying that Zenos the lawyer and Apollos are on their, on their way, see that they lack nothing. That's the mention of individuals that ends, but is not the ending of the mentioning of the team. In verse number 14, he says, And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. And let our people. This, no doubt, refers to the Christians who are in Crete. This refers to all believers, even though they go unnamed, even though they are from obscure villages in Crete, they are a part of the team. They are going to learn to take the lead in good deeds and do the right things for the glory of God. They are a part of the team. They never get mentioned. Their name is not in Holy Scripture, but they are just as much a part of the team of the body of Christ that will share the gospel. They're just as much a part of it. And similar to our situation, while it may be the elders who speak the most on behalf of this church, and while among the five it may be me that's speaking the most for the elders, Make no mistake about it. All members of the body of Christ are a part of the team. Different roles, different responsibilities, different gifts, but all a part of the team. And let our people, I believe he's referring specifically to those who are Christians in Crete, that have not been mentioned. And what does he say for them to do? Devote yourselves to good works and help cases of urgent need. And how will they know what cases are of urgent need? Through the discernment of those who will give an account before God called elders who are there to lead you. How will you know what is urgent? (laughs) How How will you know what is pressing? Trust the leadership that God's given you. But how will they guard against being unfruitful? They will go back to the basics of why they even have good deeds in the first place. You know, the best way to be, unf- the best way to be fruitful is not to just start getting busy. Oh, that's dangerous. Woo! That'll promote religious fatigue in a heartbeat. I hadn't been doing enough. I just need to do more. Oh, no. Stay away. You're going to be a jerk in a short order. You know what you need to do? Run to the cross. And after you have cherished and meditated long time on how great our marvelous redemption is through Jesus Christ our Lord, 
then let it spill over into good deeds. Don't just pick up and start getting busy. Don't become unfruitful. Oh, okay, so that, that, that concludes it. That's all the team. No. Verse 15. All who are with me send greetings to you. Here's another group of people. All who are with me. Who's me? Paul. Who's all who are with me? Some letters he mentions who it is. Some letters he does not. But it is very obvious that he has company with him. Artemis and Tychicus for sure. Sometimes he has Luke with him. Sometimes he has Barnabas with him. Sometimes he has Timothy with him. But usually Paul has someone with him. So what's going on here? There is this element of what we call mutual edification between the bodies of Christ who are in different locations. And so what is Paul doing here? He's saying, hey, Crete... You're not the only ones who are believing upon the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and spreading the gospel. Everybody here with me is saying hello to you and letting you know that God still has a people scattered throughout, as he says in Peter, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia. They're all over the place. And those are sending greetings to the people at Crete. Why is that important? Because the church has been designed for community, has been redeemed to be a part of a body, and those bodies are not the only body that... New Hope is not the only place where the gospel is being preached. It is encouraging to hear from Brazil, from Kenya, from Senegal, from Papua New Guinea, with relationships in God's providence that we actually have, that the gospel is going forward that people are being changed. And it's encouraging to us. Our testimony is encouraging to them. Verse number 15, all who are with me send greetings to you. Greet those who love us in the faith. One commentator said about this phrase that it might be a slightly, a slight comment about those who perhaps are in Crete that do not love them in the faith. And so he's being specific, saying, greet those who are in the faith because there are some who have no faith. Perhaps that's true. But let me just reiterate the point that Paul did not serve alone. Paul was on a team of chosen of God, empowered by God, a team of people who've been redeemed, called to salvation, and called to proclamation. He was on a team. Now, in my coaching experiences, not that I've got it all together, but we're pretty dang good. Not the church. I'm talking about volleyball. Y'all ain't no good. Y'all couldn't beat us, I'm telling you right now. Anyway, in my observations of coaching volleyball, if I put people in the wrong spot, it's bad. It's real bad. And sometimes just for fun, no, I'm joking, I don't do that. But it is interesting to see them try to play in roles that they're not equipped for. And they'll try, and it's just, you know, you're not going to have somebody who's four foot two hit a ball real hard on a seven foot eight net it's just not gonna happen a whole lot so you got to put them in the right positions and I have fun doing that and deciphering where they need to go and where they need to be and sometimes there are disgruntled moments imagine that among teenage girls there can sometimes be drama I know that you find that shocking but it can happen and sometimes I end up coaching the head more than I coach the game you understand what I'm saying And so I have that responsibility, and I enjoy that responsibility, and sometimes it works very, very well. Sometimes it doesn't work as well. 
But one thing I do learn about a team is that there are certain principles that are extremely important. There are certain things you've got to make sure that are happening. But in relationship to this team, the Word of God spells out that this team, the gospel proclamation, ministry-driven team, I'm not in any way trying to cheapen that by talking about volleyball and thinking that pertains, but there are some principles that are true everywhere. And one thing's for sure about this. Just as sure as every member on a volleyball team is responsible for particular things, the way I read this text, every member of the household of faith is responsible to engage in good deeds. It's not optional. It's not optional. It's not a choice you get. Every member, according to this epistle, is supposed to be involved and engaged in good deeds. Number two, every team that I've ever been a part of has a responsibility to depend on one another. I, I, I tell my hitters, re rely on your setters to, to know you well enough to give you the ball at the right spot. And when they don't, they'll make it right. Rely on one another. Trust your teammates. We have one particular player who loves to hit the ball every single time. And I said, you punch her in the nose if you call the ball and she'll get out of the way. One who loves to hit it, loves to touch it every single time. And sometimes she'll hear my command of this. Every volleyball player in here knows who I'm talking about. I'll tell her this. Trust your teammates. Trust your teammates. You are dependent upon one another. And at a higher level, the body of Christ, the household of faith, is interdependent upon one another. Interdependent. I depend on Johnny Phillips. Johnny Phillips depends on me. I depend on Danny Hargis. Danny Hargis depends on me. I depend on Kevin Spears. Kevin Spears depends on James Fultz. James Fultz can depend on Margaret or Kim or Donna. Don we are all interdependent. And this garbage of suggesting that I can be individualized in my faith is foreign to the New Testament. Foreign to the New Testament. You know what that means? It ain't in there. And many people who are Christians avoid commitment to the body of Christ for numerous reasons. I, I could suggest to you some of them. Some of them are just disgruntled. Disgruntled by hypocrisy. Little do they know that they are one and they might as well join with others. But they're disgruntled. Sometimes they're disappointed. The, the, the previous experiences they've had in religious institutions have devastated them to the degree that they want no commitment to the church. Others find it's too busy. Just too busy. I, I got a lot going on. I can't really commit to that. But you know what the flavor of our day is? They find it irrelevant. Listen to me. They find connection to a household of faith as something they can do without just fine. You know why? Because me and Jesus, we got a sweet thing going. Bull crap! If you tell me that you love the groom, you will also love his bride. Is that Bible? Yes or no? I think so. I don't care if you don't think Gary Brown is handsome. That's irrelevant. He's a part of the body of Christ. We don't need I just don't need it. You have missed out. Listen, let me tell you what you're going to do if you actually feel that way. You're going to avoid 1 Corinthians 12 is what you're going to do. You're going to say, I don't believe that. Let me, let me read it to you. We have time. All we got's time. 
The world has stopped. All we got's time. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. If you think for one moment that your small little toe on your foot is insignificant, you go ahead and walk through your house in the middle of the night to go get a drink of water. And not only if you think it's insignificant, Furthermore, if you think it's disconnected from your body. Let me tell you something. Your little toe will talk so fast to your head that it'll fly right out of your mouth. Every part that seems insignificant is a part of the body. It's necessary. Connected. And not just connected, but interdependent. What would have been more helpful for that walk through the night in the dark for a drink of water? Lights. But what good are lights if you don't have eyes? Y'all know what I'm saying. This individualized Christianity is for the birds, not for the body. Another thing we learn about this team ministry, man, is this hard. Whew, God help me. We got to involve others in the ministry and trust them to do it. Oh, my. Paul, what, a, what, a, what an example setter you are for me. By God's grace, you turned people loose to do a job that if in your arrogance you let it be that arrogance drives you and not the Spirit of God, you would have the whole time said they can't do it near as good as me. And my oh my, does the grace of God help you get over yourself to let you know that you're, you're not irreplaceable. God can bring up anybody he wants to to accomplish his good pleasure, perhaps even on a bigger sphere of influence than you ever would be. And so to entrust others to do it, you think about this, Paul is entrusting Tychicus, Titus, Artemis, Apollos, all of these brothers to do things, and listen to this, because I, listen, I, confession. I know it's going to be hard to believe. By nature, I'm a control freak. How many of y'all knew that? How many of y'all just gave you brand new information? Golly, is it that pronounced? Thank y'all for honesty, because I'm about ready to give y'all some. 
I'm a control freak by nature. And sometimes, it hasn't happened in recent years because, I mean, the Lord has just enabled me to get over it. But being able to entrust other people to do things is a part of God's design to produce humility in me and to enable them to grow and serve the Lord. Because listen, it's not a one-man show. It's not a one-man show. And we have to involve other people and trust them to do it. Don't be afraid to do that. Some people judge success in proportion to numbers instead of faithfulness and obedience. I love what John Wesley said when he said, if I had 300 men who feared nothing but God, hated nothing but sin, and were determined to know nothing among men but Jesus Christ and him crucified, I would set the world on fire. He didn't need a bunch of numbers. Just give me some willing, faithful, obedient people, and we'll turn this thing upside down. And here's a good lesson for myself. And that is, I don't think Paul was ever afraid to enlist people who were perhaps even more competent and capable than him. I think he was looking for people who could actually carry it even further than he. Could do greater things than he. Who would have been that example setter? Jesus. You will do greater things than this. So we've got to enable others to do it. He promoted, Paul promoted the ministry of others. Now it's obvious to say that every team needed godly leadership like Paul to orchestrate and lead and guide. I understand that. But right now we're talking about the vital importance of team players. And I'll tell you this too. I think this is... It's implied in the text at the very least. Good teams spend a lot of time together in order to function very well. They spend a lot of time with each other. Man, I tell you, I can't help but think about my experience in volleyball. Um, If you're familiar with volleyball at all, you actually have to do a very good job of learning each other's voices, learning each other's way of approaching things you got to spend a lot of time with each other to get pretty good at it and with any sport you've got to get good enough to be around each other to anticipate each other's next move it's just it's one of those things that we call chemistry we call team dynamic it's just very very helpful well I want to tell you that in a even more elevated way The body of Christ, and particularly those who are serving in roles of influence and responsibility, it is good when they spend time with each other. It is good. I'll tell you one of the direct benefits at New Hope Baptist Church. It's good that the elders spend lots of time with each other. It's good when... We spend not only time face-to-face, but interacting and a lot. It's helpful. We know each other's jokes. We know each other's language. We know each other's position. And we all approach things differently, although directed by doctrine that we celebrate unit, in, in unity on. But it's very beneficial to spend tons of time with each other. It's extremely beneficial. I see this in the New Testament. Paul, what is he doing? Titus, as soon as you get a replacement, you come where? To me. We're going to spend some time with each other. Paul was always looking forward to spending time with his co-laborers. Well, in this conclusion of the book of Titus, I want to ask these two questions before we head out the door. Number one, Very simply, are you on the team? Now, what do I mean by that? We've been talking a lot about being on the team and the ministry team of the New Testament, the explosion of the gospel. What do I mean by being on the team? Well, there is a clear qualifier to being on the team. It means 
have you experienced the kindness, the love, the mercy, and the grace of God at the cross through Jesus Christ? Have you been justified by his grace so that you are now, according to Titus, an heir of eternal life? Have you been saved? Have you been redeemed? Have you been converted? Have you been regenerated? All synonymous words for has God made in you a new creature? Are you on the team? And you say, yes, I'm on the team. Well, then the second question is this. Are you content to just sit on the bench and watch this whole game of redemptive history and plan play out before you with you having no involvement, then I would ask you, are you really on the team? Are you just sitting on the bench? Are you just sitting and watching everything unfold? You say, well, I'm not a preacher, David. Well, let me ask it this way. Are you using whatever gifts God entrusted to you so that one day you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. What gifts you had for the benefit of the team and the glory of Christ, you used it. Or are you just sitting and watching? Well, the only way any of this will be accomplished, whether it be regeneration, becoming a part of the body, or whether it is that you're a bench warmer, that you sit on the sidelines, and now you're convicted about it, how's any of that going to change the last sentence in the, in the epistle? Grace be with you all. The only way we're converted, grace. The only way we are transformed from a bench warmer to an active participant using my gifts to glorify Christ and be a better part of the team is grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus is the answer. Now, if you have questions about anything that I've talked about regarding salvation, any questions about what should I be doing? Perhaps that's, your, perhaps that's your struggle. Perhaps that's your struggle and you're going, I just don't know what I'm skilled in. I, I hear what you're saying, David, and I, I, I truly do want to do something. And not just for the sake of doing it, not just for the sake of religious exercise. I mean, I believe I've been born again and I, and I really do want to serve the kingdom, but I'm just struggling with figuring out how I do that. That's why God's appointed elders to help you discern that. <laughs> Nothing brings us greater delight as elders than for somebody to come, to come to us and say, help me figure out what I'm supposed to be doing for the glory of Christ. And you talk about happy times. We love doing that. But sometimes, being a part of that team called the body of Christ, particularly at New Hope, means that we have to go through things together that are difficult, that are hard, that can break our hearts, but they are necessary. They are for our good and for his glory. It's not always roses. But a team, a body, goes through successes and difficulties, and they do it together. And at the risk of sounding extremely solemn, because it is solemn, I want to lay before you what it looks like to be a part of that team. 
sadly, it has become necessary to inform you of a situation in our body involving unrepentant sin of one of our members. And after many attempts to investigate and gently restore this member, she's refused to cooperate. And the elders, therefore, have unanimously concluded it is time to take the next biblical step by involving all the members to take action. It's sad, but this is in accordance with our church covenant and our bylaws that are scripturally informed. And though this is painful, it is sorrowful, our hope and our prayer is that God will graciously use, listen close, the whole membership's response to this ongoing sin to bring about repentance that leads to restoration to the Lord, the family, and the church. We long to do this collectively for the purpose of redemption and restoration. It's called church discipline. And the Bible calls for it. When we leave this building today, in the front foyer, the elders are going to be giving you an envelope that has the particular charge that we're talking about. Those who are members, your names are clearly on the envelopes. We'll assist you with getting those. We do not want you to make a public scene about this. We believe that this is something you should take home and dads, if you're, if you're leading your home, you need to discuss this. There's one letter going home, and that, that can be read at your home. Those who are not members but are on the fringe of membership, we, we feel led to give you one so that you know what we're about and, and why we approach these things like we do. Um, and then in seven days, after you've had time to read this and look at it, in seven days, which is a week from today, we will be here to celebrate the Lord's table, but before we celebrate the Lord's table, we will take action on what you will be reading about. We will recommend, the elders will recommend that we take action collectively on this matter. It's a matter of suspension. It is not a matter of excommunication, which means we want them to get the attention, have the attention of the body that we believe this is wrong and pray your heart out that before 90 days ever expires, they come to their senses and we say, praise be to God. That's our goal. We don't take it lightly. And let me also say this. The five elders are nothing but sinners saved by grace. We fall short of God's glory too. But this cannot be ignored. And so we urge you to do that, handle that information appropriately. Um, those who are not members, we'll, we'll make sure that you get one just so that you know what we're doing. We would ask that if you have questions throughout the week that you would call us and we will bring as much clarity as possible to the situation as we possibly can. I hope you know the heart at which we do this. It is not easy. And I realize that oftentimes when you end with something like this, it is possible to forget everything that's been said but I trust the Spirit of God to press in the Word of God that we've learned today uh, because this has to be taken care of. It's part of discipline. Let's pray together. And as you leave, if you are exiting the rear, please make sure you make your way to the front because there's some things you need, okay? All right, let's pray together. Lord, we do know that in situations like this, it is very human of us, it's possible for us to hear such things and be troubled and be curious and be concerned and be broken and be heavied by these matters. But Lord, we trust that your word, which has been preached, will guide us in what we read. Help us to be 
a body that is looking more like the Son of God every day. Help us, we pray, to be a church that reflects the image of the glorious, perfect Savior, Jesus Christ. For your glory we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.